we really have to come back to design. And it's, it's not only for buildings, but as well for many other products. The key is good design and it's a holistic design. And this is, is where we have to move away from this industry driven, just selling things across the world. Dr. Christine Lemaitre is my guest on this episode of Inside Ideas, brought to you by 1.5 Media and Innovators Magazine. Christine is a real pioneer in sustainable building. As CEO of the DGNB, which stands for German Sustainable Building Council, she sets the course for a better planning and building culture in Germany for almost a decade. She was born in Gießen, Germany, and studied structural engineering at the University of Stuttgart. After working in the United States in 2003, she started working at the Institute of Lightweight Structures, Design, and Construction at the University of Stuttgart. In 2007, she started working at Bill, Billfinger Berger AG, Aktengesellschaft, as a project manager for R&D. In January 2009, she took on the role as Director of Systems of the German Sustainable Building Council. And since February 2010, Christine was appointed the CEO of this council. She has been a member of the Board of Directors of the World Green Building Council between 2016 and 2020 and Chair of the European Regional Network, making her one of the global forerunners for future-proof building on a global level. She is also a member of the Advisory Council for Baukultur of the State of Baden-Württemberg and of the Sustainability Board of the German Property Federation, ZIA. She is a co-initiator of the Global Initiative, Initiative Building Sense Now and received the Eco Innovator Award from Global Green Economic Forum in 2019. Christine is a true believer in making a positive contribution to our global challenges through buildings and is a dedicated advocate for more and transparent quality of our built environment. Christine, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, thanks for having me. It's so wonderful that you can make it in your in your busy schedule. Um, and thank you for giving me your short bio. So I know you, I could have went on much longer and um, I, I, I really didn't want to make it even shorter than that because you've been doing this for a long time. You've been involved in the built environment for uh, a lot of years. And it, it's important that our listeners understand this. Uh, a lot of our listeners probably aren't very familiar with the built environment, although they should be, because that is what is creating a most vital part of our future, but also one that will determine, is that a sustainable future? Is that a resilient future? Is that one that will be future-proof? And so with, with that kind of a, a caveat in, in the beginning, I want to ask you, with all this years of experience and you've been uh, in the positions that you've been in and seen what you have seen, were you at all prepared for this pandemic time, for this craziness we've experienced these last 12 or plus more months? No, not at all. I think uh, it, it, it was a shock, like I think for all of us, uh, how our world can change so drastically in, in just a small matter of time. And uh, on the other side, I think it has shown us how vulnerable we are um, and how how global we are already. You know, it is not somewhere, you know, in, in Asia or somewhere in South America. It's basically if it's somewhere, it's everywhere in the world. And I think that relates as well to climate change. It's not a an issue of the countries of the global south. It will affect us all, you know, and, and I think this being a, a global community. Um, I think this kind of understanding to me got really emphasized in these past 12 months that this is not like a German thing or a US thing. It's really, it's for all of us. We're all in the same boat. That's absolutely it, for sure. Uh, there, the one big reason I asked for that because you've, you've been doing this and you kind of practice what you preach 
um, a lot of people during this time um, have gone stir crazy in their homes. And, and, and I kind of made a joke in, in, uh, we, in the beginning of my podcast in, in 2020, I had a professor actually from Trinity College with this library behind me. Um, he, he does a program called uh, Human Beasts. And we made this kind of wise comment, but uh, maybe also a little sarcastic that how are the human zoos that we've created working for, for us? And so, so what we've seen is that some people have created some wonderful homes, some wonderful living environments, and they're very content. But many, many, and I would say probably the majority of us were caught off guard that we would now be spending an exorbitant amount of time in our our homes, our vonungs, our, our apartments, our houses, and we're, we're not at all satisfied, or, or a lot of us are not at all satisfied with these human zoos, and we've created them for ourselves. Obviously, architects, designers, and your 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 who, whoever designed your home or your apartment, you know, obviously took a big part of that. With that question in mind, from, from looking behind you, it looks like your human zoo is very well, but did you also notice that maybe your human zoo could have some uh, different changes, improvements, uh, um, things that bubble to the surface, not just for you, but also for those uh, of your clients and customers and, and uh, builders? Um, well, I think, you know, I think in one side, uh, I completely agree. And to me, that is always somehow crazy that if you're not by profession involved in the building industry that people just don't really pay attention to our built environment and us countries in the global north we spend an average 90 percent of our time in and around buildings you know we live somewhere we go to school somewhere we work somewhere we spend a lot of our free time in cities and i think now in this corona pandemic um, it was not just only the own house or own apartment it was as well all of a sudden the question where can I be and enjoy the outdoors? Because all of a sudden, you know, you could not like what you normally would do, take the train and, and go somewhere. And, and all of a sudden you were stuck to, to your environment. And I think um, that, that a lot of people kind of realize that now, that, you know, that is a very big part of our life. Um, I have to say for me personally, for me, it's one of my, my biggest passions is to always build something or change something in the apartment. So it's more, I think for my family, they're happy when I'm very busy and travel a lot because when I'm home, I'm starting to come up with projects. So uh, to me, it was more like now I had the time to maybe even think about these things more. Um, but I, I really hope this is something that uh, hopefully the pandemic one day will go away. And that is something we keep um, that, that this understanding is, this is our built environment and especially coming to climate change. We are we're now already in the process, you know, where this extreme weather um, situations uh, get more and more, you know, people can feel it even now in, in Germany. I mean, we now have the big flood in Australia again. I mean, these are like things that normally happen once in the century. And now it feels like they happen all the time everywhere. Um, so we will have to adapt to so many things and our built environment. And this is what I always tell people and our members. This is something we can shape in a way that we feel healthy and happy in it. And, and we have to take this, this positive opportunity much more. You know, it's sure it's a thing, but it's our built environment. It's our environment. Uh, and this is where, where we live, where we spend our life. And we have to be much more aware of it. We have to, to look at it more from the quality aspect and really change this kind of attitude when it comes to designing cities, changing things in a city or even in, in your own personal space. So I really, I think to a lot of people, they, they kind of got the point. I just hope it's gonna stick with them and, and it translates into concrete action and not something you know that all of a sudden then goes away because other things will be more important than all of a sudden. Yeah, there's always that fear that we will go back to business as usual or go back to the way it was and, and uh, really, that's a trap. It's actually not so good. We should be thinking how we can be future proof, how we can have more resilience, or should this occur again, how, how can we still continue a nice existence, a nice uh, way of living and, and interacting? 
Um, we're we're going to get into deeper models a little bit later in the conversation uh, in our conversation more about livability of the built environment. But I would like to touch upon a few trends that have occurred during the pandemic. Um, one is max mass exodus out of major cities uh, in Europe. A lot of people are moving to Sweden. A lot of people are living the big cities to go somewhere in the country or somewhere where it's more affordable or where they don't need to be in the combustion of, of a busy city because they're, they're not working at, at an office building anymore. So there's no need to, to do that. New York's a big mass exodus. But then also we're seeing more conversions of vans and buses and, into living things so people can kind of be, be mobile. That's a, a, a big, huge trend. And at the beginning when the, uh, of the lockdowns uh, globally, the Home Depots, the Baumarks, the places where people get their hardware supplies to fix up their house or finally repair these things uh, were just, man, people were going crazy, not only with gardening, but just fixing up the things that now that they're seeing every day in their homes to get them up to a more 24 seven livable condition or more functional than it was before where they didn't have time. Um, there, there is kind of um, one other thing in that whole uh, respect that is uh, unique. People are really like um, having more domestic violence, more broadband issues, sharing computers. People are having environmental ergonomic issues, whether they're in their apartment or their home, they're working from the couch or working from the bed. They're in this whole area of kind of the new ergonomics of, of mixing your work life with your home life among those who, who got sick as well or lost their jobs during this time. So we've seen so many things happen in this time. You specifically from um, your organization, DGNB, saw an uptake in, in builders, uh, an uptake in, in different things. Tell us what experience you've seen in those trends, what that tells you, maybe what's bubbled to the surface in, in this whole environment. Yeah, well, I think like you just described, it's a big social experiment we're all in and, and we'll have to see you know, what sticks and what is maybe now a trend and every trend is followed by, by another trend. And uh, I mean, last year when the pandemic hit, we were all shocked. You know, we 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 moved people into the home office environment right away, um, and we were very cautious because sure we were concerned. You know, all of a sudden we had like two years of you know Fridays for Future and and making this whole climate change and and sustainability discussion something you know for the whole society, and you know from one day to another the media was just full with the pandemic. You know, the, the whole climate change issue completely disappeared. And, and we were very concerned, I have to say, you know, we, we didn't know really what was happening. And, and we felt like, oh no, you know, maybe now they, they kind of, you know, are, are focusing on other things. And I have to say we were very positively surprised um, because we quickly realized that all our members um, were basically, keeping up you know the work or even you know taking the time not traveling to meetings and not doing events to really you know work on their strategies especially on a on the municipality level you know what we saw were like cities were really you know keeping the pressure um but at the same time already knew that they will have less income through the the taxes from from businesses um, so that was was really, I would say, a very positive surprise. And we as well as DGNB, you know, we're doing a lot of events. We're, we're out there and, and this is a big part of what we do. And I have to say a big part of what I love about the job is you meet a lot of people and you meet a lot of positive people because otherwise it can be a very frustrating business because you meet as well a lot of people who tell you all the time all the reasons why things are not working or why they cannot be more sustainable. So we basically said, okay, let's take all the energy and start finishing things or let's do reports we always wanted to do. So we published an SDG report. We did a, a study on the new taxonomy indicators from the European Commissioner of this context of sustainable finance. So we did a lot of things and we put a lot of things out there to a point where basically members approached me and were saying, well, DGNB seems to be very hyperactive. You know, people really notice this kind of 
there's a lot of movement and a lot of dynamic. But I think it resonated really well with the market. So we we didn't really notice in or on the contrary, we grew in membership. So we, we didn't, you know, we were concerned that companies will cancel, especially we have a very diverse membership from the 1,300. We have like small architectural firms all the way to big corporations. And we were very concerned that especially the smaller firms, engineering companies, you know, would cancel membership. Um, but it that didn't happen. So we're, we're still growing in membership. We see more and more certification happening. Uh, we started last year then out of this, especially where we saw a lot of dynamic on the on the city level, because we believe you know, the climate change decision will be made if the municipalities, if cities are able to pull it together or not, because there are all the topics come together. So we started an initiative for cities. It's called Climate Positive Cities. Um, and it was like, you know, in Corona times, we just sent out an, an email to the contacts we had. And then we had the first virtual workshop last year in July with 30 participants, which was quite challenging to do something so conceptually in a, in a virtual environment without really knowing the people. Um, but it ended in September, we launched the initiative with 11 cities who committed. Um, and now we're around 30 and we have the first ones from Austria already. So we see a lot of, thank God, I would say, you know, there's, there's a still the growing dedication and the ones who started already working on it, for them, it was more like, sure, we're gonna continue this down this road. Um, so yeah, we're, we're very, we're very, very positive surprise um, on how as well our community kind of came through the pandemic so far. So the U.S. Uh, Green Business Council, it's it's in Germany, and so just for my listeners, I want to say you you guys are not just in German speaking countries; you're also in Spain, all throughout Europe. And uh, I believe you're, there's no adversity for you guys to go with a standard to the U.S. or to Asian countries at all. It's, it's something for everyone. It was just initiated here. You guys are, are here and you've, you've set the bar higher. Um, and that's really why we're here to talk about some of the, the fabulous things uh, that you're doing. Um, I'm from the United States and so... <clears throat> I kind of have this beautiful lens of both worlds. I live in, in Germany, but when you go to a, a normal house or, or um, even an apartment in, in Germany, it's really weird because when you're first there, there's like, they, they do the counts of the bedrooms much different. You walk into the kitchen and they're like, this is the kitchen. You're like, well, what? there's no kitchen here. And I'll say, oh yeah, you've got to bring that. You've got to bring or, or build your own kitchen. And then you're like, there's no lights. And oh, yeah, that's the, the what they call the Russian lighting system. It's just the, the wiring hanging out of the ceiling. And so many people that, that I, you know, friends or people that I know around, they, they move into a place and they just leave that Russian lighting and, and kind of a makeshift, uh, makeshift way of living. And so it's a unique environment, but that's kind of I hope it's changing. And so that's one question I want to ask you is, is do you see that changing in Germany? But that standard is different, not in only in Germany, it's a different in Austria, it's different in Switzerland, it's different in the rest of the EU, and it's uh, for sure di different in other countries of the world. Um, what you guys are doing is taking these old outdated standards of the built environment and you're raising the bar. You're saying, okay, here's the standards out, you know, out in the world, but that, that's not worthy of human live, livability. That's not worthy of us. We should do a better, much more long-term environment and kind of collaborate more with those who will be living in those environments. Uh, what kind of trends? And, and, and the question I guess is really, goes to this global citizenry. So we need a global structure. You mentioned it so nicely just a few moments ago that we're not so local or, or, or close in this area that it, it's really a global situation we're in. And that really relates to the built environment. So you've set the bar higher, but how do you feel about a world as a global citizen without nations, borders and division, especially when it comes to the built environment? Well, I, I think it's uh, you have to differ differentiate a little bit. I mean, what we are stand for is a is a different design approach. It's this holistic approach on understanding and defining a building, and as well designing a building. So, 
this is part of the DNA of the DGNB system is the life cycle approach. So where all the buildings and districts we're certifying have to do a life cycle assessment. And uh, yeah, like you said in the introduction, I started with DGNB in 2009. We were six people in a small office space in Stuttgart. We had no idea what we were doing. I think maybe I can say that now without uh, shocking anyone. And I remember when I was, and we started working internationally actually as well in 2009 because we had other organizations approaching us and they were curious about this life cycle approach and life cycle costing, you know, where, because we said, or this is a part of our philosophy is you have to look at it holistically. Um, and it is not difficult to build an expensive sustainable building. The challenge is to build a sustainable building that makes sense as well in an economic way. Because it's not about cheap buildings. And I think that's what we've seen in the past decades, you know, building as quickly and cheap as possible. And then someone else will, will deal over the life cycle with all the issues. But it's it has to make sense in an economic way. And I remember in 2009 or 2010, when I was invited, you know, to Brussels or abroad, you know, presenting the DG and the German approach, which I think people are always a little bit, oh, well, the Germans, you know. It's always very accurate and, and very, very <laughs> thorough. Yes. And, you know, they were looking at me when I was talking about life cycle approach, like, oh, God, the German nerds, you know, who can do a life cycle analysis of a building, you know, how and no data. And now, and I have to say, that's a positive thing, like 11, 12 years later, everyone talks about embodied carbon. Everyone talks about the gray emissions out of the building material. So, and I think for an industry where basically the innovation cycles are five years, you know, every five years you see a jump in innovation. It cannot get quicker. It's not like the automotive industry or other industries. I think in this 10 years, a lot has moved, not scale, in this, not, not enough scaled for our or for my taste, but at least, you know, it's moving. So, and this is this understanding of, of the holistic design approach, this is something we want to internationalize. We want to offer, you know, the knowledge, the know-how we have, the mistakes we made. I think because in the built environment, we as well have to talk more about mistakes. You know, making mistakes is an element of learning, of our learning experience. But when it comes to buildings, we see so many bad examples, but then you always see like the great renderings, you know, of something that will be constructed there. But then we don't have a culture of asking afterwards, so how did it turn out? And this is, is as well another part of our, our certification that you have to do some quality assurance checks in the end. Like for an instance, you have to do an indoor air quality testing four weeks after completion of the building. And if you don't meet the requirements, the building is not certifiable and you cannot do anything to change that. So that puts a lot of pressure on using the right materials, you know, making sure there's a quality assurance on the construction side. So I think this kind of understanding of quality and holistic approach and design is very, very crucial. What I'm on the other side, where we're really trying to push for it in the end as well, it's climate and cultural based when we build cities and, and buildings. And because we can is not a good enough reason to build a glass tower somewhere in the desert because then we just have to heal the bad architecture with energy. So it's it's kind of the mixture, and I think that maybe makes it a little bit difficult to to grasp because we're not we're not a certification system organization. We're an association who wants to make the built environment better, and we have a certification system which we use as a market transformation tool which stands for these kind of values. But on the other side, we're really pushing for, hey, please take the time, take a moment and think, where are you in the world? What makes sense here? What's the culture? What's the climate conditions? And really go down and, and don't do this one fits all approach. I think we see that two way too much in the world, but really go down and sit down with your architect, with your design team, and make the right choice for that building for the people in the end living there using the building. And so this is kind of the, the big gap and transformation we always have to bring across when we try to explain what we do. It basically has these different aspects to it. I absolutely love that. And thank you for ed educating us and, and, and bringing us up to speed with uh, for, for those of my listeners who are, aren't aware of that. This certification is is not your core objective your vision but it is a wonderful thing that you're offering and i want to 
let my listeners know why, but also want you to kind of, since you're the expert, to explain it better than I could. Um, there's leads, there's bream, there's ISO standards, there's different built environment, the US Green Business Council, different councils. Um, I'm good friends with Bill McDonough, William McDonough, and Delta Development, Michael Braumgart uh, for Cradle to Cradle and Upcycling. I'm big on Ellen MacArthur and the circular economy principles, ways of thinking. But out there, I have not seen a certification like yours. So on all of those models that are out there, there's always one part that's kind of lacking and missing, and that's the economy. That's the in German Wirtschaft um, portion of that, does it have a return? Is it long-term uh, a doable project? And in your pillars, you have this transformation that you do in your certification and your built environment. First and foremost is the environment, and the second is the economy, and the third is society. And that all of those are well-rounded so that they're all kind of balanced um, and, and it also really ties to um, kind of donut economic thinking, circular economy thinking, planetary boundary thinking. And it's really, you guys are the leader for Europe's biggest network for sustainable building. And I haven't seen anywhere in the world, uh, and this is what I'd like to know from you, if there it does exist, I know you'd tell me, but uh, are there any... Any other great certifications we should be looking towards people thinking the same way that you guys are and offering the tools? I mean, you also offer the academy, the navigator, the systems, the tools to help not just builders, uh, but also members who could be architectures, designs, engineering companies that come in and have those tools to, to make sure that they can change that environment. Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I I don't know. I think we're very unique in that sense because we're a very content-driven organization, as you just described. And I think this is the big luck we had when when the DGNB was founded, that we had so many from the beginning, like really experts of the field, who said, you know, this is not about my business case. I really want to make a difference. And they basically put all their knowledge for free into that certification system to really say let's do something together that is you know away from always you know because the building industry is very competitive competitive you know it's always everyone is competing against the other and and this is the spirit we how we were founded is about collaboration is about sharing knowledge um, it's about talking about content and this is what I still see today and I think this is, is a very unique thing because we are such a diverse organization we could never do lobbying for just you know one interest part so it's basic but if people start talking about content and not project related but really talking about what should be the energy standard or what how can we translate circular economy on a building level, all of a sudden, it doesn't matter if they're working for an architectural firm, if they're build, working for an investor for building material manufacturer. And I think this is the powerful thing we were doing um, is basically always to, to bring people content driven together and to follow as well this data approach. Um, so everything we put in the certification system, we're constantly evaluating, does it work? How does the market trans react to it? So we're always trying to pull the market, push the market, but not overdo it. So it's really this transformational process. It's a lot of dialogue. And uh, I don't know any green building council or organization where the philosophy of the organization is immediately translated into this market transformation tool as a certification system. You know, this is for us when when I tell you we, you know, our philosophy is it has to be a circular building, toxin-free, um, climate positive building, so produces more energy than it uses, it's good for biodiversity and so forth, you will find that one-to-one -one in our certification systems. So this is really, and I think this differentiates us as well from, you know, as well, maybe environmental organization, because we're not just saying, you know, you should change this or that. We're basically translating what we think is right in a tool and we bring it to market. And uh, 
So I think this is a very unique, unique approach. And on the other side, like I said, we really believe in collaboration and we have great partnerships. Like in 2009, we started to work with the Austrian Green Building Council. A few years later, the Danish Green Building Council joined us. And a year ago, the Spanish Green Building Council joined us and they all translated the DGNB system to their local conditions, codes and standards. And they're using it in the same way there. And from that, we as well get so much back. And I think this is something to me, it's quite important that we always keep open-minded as an organization that we as well certain kind of self-critical and that we always try to stay on goal. So it, it has to be always doing the right thing and trying to push the market as quickly as possible towards the right thing. And I think another thing that differentiates us from other certification systems out there is really that innovation speed. We basically have a two to three year, two to three years rhythm uh, for a new version of the certification system. So basically this is an ongoing learning process, an ongoing feedback process. And it's always like, okay, the market has understood this, what is the next thing we could introduce into the market? And it's this holistic part, like the initiatives you just um, mentioned, you know, it's, it is really to bring everything together because in the building, everything comes together. It's about the human centric design. It's about the climate goals. It's about the emissions from the materials. It's about the health part of, of the, the building. It's about mobility. It's about biodiversity. So it's really this, this balance I think is a, is a very crucial part because on the building, you always have conflicting goals when these things come together. And if you just emphasize on one thing too much, you risk making a mistake or forgetting something important or using not the high pot the overall potential of a building. And this is what our certification system is basically trying to grasp, is trying to balance out and therefore as well make it transparent and make it data driven so the decisions are made out of the not the, the sustainability gut feeling we all have you know when we see wood we always think it's more sustainable but if it's painted with the wrong paint it's just toxic waste um, so and and i think this is as well the value of the certification system that an investor can relate to it a bank can relate to it as well as an architect as an engineer as a construction company because it's fact-based it's data driven so you haven't really come out directly and give me your 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 vision, your why, your purpose as an organization, but I've I've heard it many times. There was something that you said earlier, and, and I kind of just want to touch upon this. Whether you're um, someone who who's moving into a new apartment or a new house or into a new uh, commercial building for your office or for your production, that is. Um, in the past, something that, how can we do this as cheap as possible to make it affordable or to, to um, be competitive with the market? That's kind of some of the standards that we've seen worldwide. It's not just, uh, it's not just uh, here. Definitely Germany has a higher standard than, than normal and costs is, is more. But there's this key principle that when it doesn't matter what you produce, whether it's food or an iPhone or an apartment or a house, uh, if you cheapen a product, a house, an apartment, you're actually cheapening life. There are corners cut. Somewhere at the end, something has to, has to pay for that cheapening of that. So whether you, you okay, a couple of years ago, you bought this cheap apartment and it had Russian lights and wasn't a passive house, whatever. And now you're on lockdown, you're realizing how much that's truly costing you and also costing our environment, costing your living environment. You've just cheapened your own life. And that's kind of why it says, we need to pay a little more attention to how we build our human zoos and who builds them. So are they following to certain standards, to certain certifications? Are we using the people who are thinking, no, we don't just want to provide them with four walls. We want to provide the, our consumers, our customers with a future-proof home, a home that's going to last them for multiple generations, an office building that isn't going to be a burden on, on the bottom line that will be a part of their organization. 
many times in, in um, our world, especially in the commercial uh, and production area, organizations will move into building, use it until they can't use it anymore, and then almost leave it like a super fun site for the city or someone else to clean up and then go start over at a new green field or a new area. And, and um, that is a big impact on our world that uh, cradle to grave, as William McDonough would say it with the cradle to cradle uh, uh, thinking, you know, that's uh, this throwaway mentality. And on a planet of finite resources, it really comes back quickly to, to, to give us the effects. And so I, I guess at this point, I'd really like to have you more or less express the overarching values and principles of what are totally different for those who haven't grasped it yet of, of what those bad examples I just gave. <laughs> Yeah, let's. Uh, it's a yeah. Maybe it's uh, difficult to sometimes put it together, but in the end, I always translate sustainability with quality and future proof. And I think what you just described is is what we let happen is that we made buildings into investment goods. And uh, I, I have that discussion a lot. And you know, we have this real estate industry in, in Germany, and then they like to use English terms, you know, in between. And and one part is, you know, it's not a house, it's an asset, you know. And and I asked a few years ago in one of these rounds, and was just that getting crazier and crazier, you know, with the English terms and and the asset and turn the asset and blah blah blah. And I said, well, but you realize this is a house where people live in or they work in it. And I think this is. This is something we let happen. We all together. I mean, this is one of the number one investment goods today are buildings. It's real estate. I mean, if you have like money in the bank, if you do a retirement fund, these companies, they take the money and they to a very high percentage invest it in buildings. And for them, it just matters if it's fully rented because, you know, they may have to make a revenue. And I think this is something we try to not change completely in a way, but at least, you know, for the, the real estate industry where it's just a business, um, that at least, you know, they have to fulfill quality standards when they undergo their business. And I think this is something, you know, they've just been doing, you know, doing, like you said, you know, they want to make money and compared to other products where you have a full product line and the more you produce, you know, you the more the, the money is you could maybe make on a product. The problem is every building is unique. I mean, sure, we have example exceptions in the, in the small residential market, but looking at commercial buildings, you have one product. And sure, if for you, it's a business. People try, you know, to with the least amount of money, make the most out of it. So the 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 money they make is is a maximum. You know, this is, is just not so. And I think this is something where we say, okay, if you build. If you do that, you have to fulfill sustainability quality, quality standards and you have to make it future proofed because this is we, we have a bigger responsibility than just building something like you said. And then a few years later, they're moving to some to another place. And another, I think, big part of the game is is the, the cities and the municipalities. It's their responsibility to make sure that there is no greenfield developments anymore. It's. It's their responsibility that buildings are not just being demolished and replaced, but that buildings are being refurbished. Because if we look at the gray emissions, we need to work with the existing building stock. We cannot just rebuild everything all the time. This is, is not the way it is. So what we're trying is basically to introduce this understanding of quality and of future proofness of, of the buildings and then take it and address every different stakeholders in a different way, because the circle of blame when it's about buildings is endlessly, it's always someone else's fault. I guess you had, you know, it's, I think it's when you talk about sustainability, it's always this in Germany, we have a lot of this, yes, but it's expensive. Yes, but you know, the other one, it's always the other one who's responsible. And mostly it's then the one who's not in the room which most of the times are politicians. And then in the end, it's like, you know, the politicians and they should and the regulations. And this is where I have to say over the years, I have stopped thinking that there's this one reason why people would change. So what I'm trying to do is 
to close the gaps for excuses. So as we call it, no more excuses anymore. So whatever they tell you, you're like, well, we have data that proves it's not more expensive. We have talked to the architect and they would be able to do that. We have to talk to the mayor and he can do that. So it's a, it's a, it's a very tedious work sometimes, but I think this is, is my vision because we have to reach people. In the end, like we said in the beginning, people are making the decision what to build where. This is not growing. This is not a given. So we can make that choice. And I think, and I see that a lot with our members, but as well with buildings being certified or our partners as well internationally. If you have a right person who's really fighting for it, and it's not just making out excuses why things cannot, cannot go, but it's really fighting for it, a lot of things can change. And I think this is my core vision maybe to come down to it is we have to reach people. We have to activate people and we have to get the lazy people to start moving and to the over-engaged people maybe to as well listen to other people so they're not over-challenging them. So it's really, in the end, I think we have to create a movement, not only for sustainable buildings, but when it comes to sustainability in general. And it cannot just be a few people who kind of set a good example because we're not gonna save the world with lighthouse projects. We can only save the world if we scale it up. And for that, we need to reach people and we have to make them understand it's about quality and it's about the, the future proofness of, of what we design, what we build and how we maintain our buildings. I love that. Thank you so much. It's kind of what I'm seeing. And, and you know, if, I, if ever I say anything that's not in align with, with what, what you guys do, just call me on the carpet. But I almost see that you, you know, here's the government uh, code standard building requirements, you know, whether it's a PUD or a HUD or whatever built environment laws, rules, regulations, and standards there are. I almost see that you've taken the bar and set it much higher, uh, on not just the sustainability, but sustainability, the environment, the economic, and the society version. What is a better system, a better model that works for all of us and works long time, much more long term? Um, are there any aspects in, in what you do that would would that you would call uh, regenerative principles or uh, circular economy principles that are built in there? I know you you guys have released some reports around circular economy and livability and different things like that how, how does that take part because those are kind of more or less they've been around for a long time but in the business world in the built environment they're kind of new um how, how do you build regenerative how do you do regenerative farming how do you do regenerative economies and, and how do we get circular economy uh, there are some tools out there by the way from ellen MacArthur foundation they have this circuletics uh uh, um, type of a program 2.0 that can help you with things and there are tools available but I, I just kind of asking a little bit further how, how do you guys get into that yeah um, first you're completely right I mean what we do is voluntary a voluntary standard so basically um, all the criteria are based on what's requirement by the the law or by the code if there is any um, and then it's about awarding if you do more on the voluntary level. And I think this is very important because we all know if you have to do something, you approach it with a different mindset. If when you have this thing, oh, let's do, you know, we could do more and then we'll be rewarded for that. Um, so this is the, the philosophy of the DGNB system. And the holistic approach as well is something I think codes and regulations or the law will never be able to fulfill. I mean, maybe it's a German thing, but if, I would talk, we have 37 criteria in the new construction scheme. If I would have to do lobbying and talk to the ministries about that, I would have to talk to five different ministries uh, in Germany, but they don't talk to each other. So, I mean, I think you can spend a lifetime trying to kind of make them understand, but from our experience, the market is more willingly moving with, with this kind of approach and they're already doing more because there's a market standard which normally is way above what regulations is asking for. So, and, um, so this is where we always try as well to push the boundary, where we always try to find the balance where we see, ah, oh, the market you know, has picked that up. Or like when we started, 
we had like interdisciplinary planning as an own criteria, you know, so that an architect together with the engineers in the beginning um, is, is designing a project. We took that out over the years out of the system because everybody's doing that now, which I think is a, is a positive thing. And so we, we had some elements of circular economy or the circular thinking um, right from the beginning, like this life cycle approach. We always had a criteria for deconstruction um, so that during the design process, they already had to think on how decon to deconstruct what they are designing. And then in 2018, we said, okay, we think we have to step up. Uh, circularity is a very big topic. It's uh, a topic that influences the re resource efficiency, but as well the climate goals. Um, and then, but we, then we felt like the markets maybe not not ready. And you know, the moment you put it down in a criteria, even if it's voluntarily, you have some clients who are like getting very serious about it and are really putting a lot of pressure on their design team. Why can we not get this credit and why? So we said, okay, let's do something something different. So we did our version 2018, um, where we introduced a bonus system, like basically an on top motivational system um, regarding circular economy, where we basically took all the ideas and all the concepts from cradle to cradle, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, you know, from different business models like products as a service to toxin free materials and, and so forth, and integrated, I would, I think, in around 60% of the criteria of the DGNB system, but as something like really on top, you know, to, to give out inspiration to the market and to award them, but as well take down the barrier that they feel like we cannot really experiment because it's already like part of the criteria. So this is for us is a very big part is the circular economy um, bonus system we introduced in 2018. We just launched last year the city district scheme in the version 2020, where we as well introduced circular economy and the city district level in the same philosophy. Um, and then, but then we still felt, and I'm a structural engineer by training. And so I'm I'm very interested in, you know, in fact, so maybe I'm an engineering nerd, but you know, you see all these great examples you just referenced to a park 2020 from Del Delta development. And you know, they tell you all the thoughts they had in design, and then you look at the building and then you wonder, but is it really working at the end of the lifespan? And then we said, well, the only way to find out, and this is, I think, maybe a very unique way on how we work, is for our certifications as well a learning tool. So about two years ago, we said, okay, but we, we need to, we have to make a change now. It's not enough to put circularity into the design today. And then in 30, 40 years, we will see if we were right or wrong. So we started to develop a deconstruction certificate. So really for the deconstruction process of a today building. Um, and I have to say, it was an amazing learning experience because we worked with deconstruction companies who are normally completely out of the conversation talking about sustainability or, you know, they were very surprised when we approached them. And, but we learned so much. Um, and this is basically now what we were now having the first project certified. Um, we're trying now to address municipalities with that certification, but because there we emphasize, you know, that you keep the existing material in place, that you do a deconstruction design, so you really have a chance and the time to do something with the materials you take out. Um, so they, they're not just agreeing that buildings are being demolished, but that they emphasize this as well, quality and transparency on this very, I think, very important life cycle part of a building. Um, and eventually we would like then when we generated more data and more knowledge, we will translate that into the new construction scheme and will introduce that the predicted de demolitioning cost will be part of the life cycle cost. So coming back to the economic part, that when you design a building today that you already have the numbers, what will it cost me to demolish the building? And one last thing maybe to that, uh, because that was really for me, like I said, I'm a structure engineer and I studied lightweight structures and then you learn it's better to screw than to glue. Um, and I was sitting there with the CEO of this deconstruction company and I was saying, well, you know, when you go into a site and isn't it better when it's screwed, you know, than when the things are glued together. And he was looking at me like he didn't get the question. And then he's like, well, have you ever tried to unscrew a screw that has been fully loaded for 30 years? And I'm like, no. And he's like, us neither, you know? And then he took me on a tour, the big machinery they have. And I realized 
this is a completely different approach and we have to translate this kind of knowledge into design today because what we sometimes do in this very detailed level, they don't work like this. And so this is, I think, where we as well have to close the knowledge loop, coming back to the circularity part. Uh, and yeah, this is uh, another part of the puzzle we're now working on. That is absolutely so beautiful to hear. And um, one thing you touched upon, but I just want to clarify. So it's not only the built environment, it's the deconstruction environment. It's also the real estate environment. It's also the restoration or uh, renovation, renovation environment. Yeah, so you can actually take existing buildings. Okay, instead of tearing that down, what can we still use the certification for to, to, to change it and, and make it future proof? And so you're really um, going into what, what I love and that is systems thinking, the systems. And you have, you know, you have a system on, on your website and, and a specific portal for, you know, understanding that better. But the systems is so important because it's all facets of the complete system. And when you mentioned the, the different ministries that aren't anywhere talking to each other or aligned, I've dealt with that I so often. Thing. I don't know. Oh, especially a journey, but it's, it's a global thing. It's actually um, the, the model's broken. The, the, the system of that governance, the system of way things work is kind of just broken by default and is it's in need of an overhaul um, and I don't want to get into politics but for example I I did a large-scale building as as well and I had to go to five ministries for my one building and you know it had to do with agriculture it had to do with uh, uh, economics it had to do with energy it had to do you know with these five ministries and all of them say, oh, that's agriculture. Oh, that's energy. Oh, that's this ministry. And to get them to unify, to get them to come together, it's it's much easier what I hear you guys have done, what I see, what you just mentioned, is to set the bar higher. And let's say, let's meet all those ministries where they've set the bar low, their requirements, but let's set the bar much higher so that not only do we meet those requirements so that we don't have to deal with the ministries in that respect to lobbying or getting the politicians to agree or change up with a new system, but to create a system or, or something that works for everyone much longer and, and gives that future proof. And so I, I love that, that you explain that to us and, and, and because I, I felt that pain to, to, you know, to, to do that. And it's much easier to set the bar higher and kind of unify on a much, much different level. Um, and yeah, you mentioned Sh Schiphol Park 2020. There's also um, a, a big new project in Saudi Arabia. It's also uh, controversial, um, Neom City. And then there's also the Red Sea project. Um, th they're, they're controversial, but it's funny how they look so strongly to Europe, to Germany, to those certifications, those standards, because the built environment here is so much of what they want in those desert areas or the areas where they want to build uh, those environments. Um, and then in, in Germany, I work with a, a, a new organization um, that I just started working with as Wiesmann, who does a lot in uh, the built environment for climate and, and HVAC and refrigeration and things. And they're a very big family company, but they have this strong vision of what the future of our built environment needs to be, how we, those vital things around refrigeration, around heating, are important aspects that go into commercial buildings and to residential buildings, and that really need to be, start getting up to speed. And that brings me to, to, to kind of a, a question I have for you. It's a big question. Um, I, I think in the built environment globally, we're kind of behind the eight ball. We're, we're behind the times. We're not where we need to be to keep up with our exponentially growing world and our, our, our infrastructures in the built environment, residential, commercial, uh, are just not up to up to speed. Is that just me who feels that, or is that actually uh, the truth? And what are your thoughts and feelings on this? Will we make the curve? Are we going to meet up with the future and have those environments, or 
what are your thoughts and feelings and processes on this and, and how it's growing and shaping up? Oh, that's, uh, yeah, I have to say in a way, I'm a little bit concerned because what we see is this, I always call it the McDonald's effect. You know, you, you have the same time type of downtown in New York, in Berlin, in somewhere South America, in Mumbai, in, in Hong Kong. And, but you have a different climate and cultural context. And I think it's about setting examples. And I have that discussion a lot, you know, because Germany is a small country. And, you know, then I always hear, well, why us, you know, the CO2 emissions in China, Africa, India? And I'm like, yes. But I, and then I always tell the story, you know, we, we founded this international initiative building sense now, where we as well try to activate architects and engineers to advise their client in a different way, because it's not a, a sign of being modern to build a glass tower in a climate where it doesn't belong, in the culture where it doesn't belong. So, and I think we, we need to have a different approach to, to this kind of, of building. And we did a workshop in India two years ago uh, with 30 architects discussing that, you know, climate and cultural sensitive design and you know, as well, the, the critical maybe overuse of, of air conditioning units. I mean, every 30 seconds in the next 30 years, there will be an AC unit sold somewhere in the world. And I think this is something where you see that the comfort understanding not even takes one generation. So if you get used to this, you know, the air is moving, it's kind of cold, you know, all of a sudden you feel it as refreshment and you want it. And, and this is what happens now in the Asian countries, what happens in, in Africa. And so we had that discussion in India, in a building that in the south of India, it's one of the hottest spots in India, in Oroville, you maybe know the, the, yes, yes. the city. And it was a building without air conditioning and just with this big ceiling fence. And, uh, you know, after coats, you know, it would be way too hot, but you could work there, you could have a workshop. And we had that discussion all day, like, you know, now you're coming from Europe and tell us we cannot have your standard, da, da, da. And then in the evening, one of the architects came to me and it's like, well, what you just all explained, you know, is it how you build in Germany? You know, do you do really in Germany all the things you should do? And I'm like, no. And I just wanted to tell him the story, you know, about how difficult the market is in politicians. And then he looks at me and he's like, well, but if you Germans don't know how to do it, how should we know how to do it? And I'm like, oh my God, this is the message we're sending to the world that not that we're willingly not being more ambitious or doing the things, but they think we don't know how to do it. And and I think this is something what we have as well, very urgently to get out as a message globally. We have to rest there again, reach people and we have to make them understand that we make as well mistakes. You know, we over insulated our buildings in Germany. Now we have a lot of waste, you know, you can just uh, burn or, you know, have toxic waste. So this is not the way to do so we are making mistakes and i think we have to discuss these kind of mistakes and now we're already in the middle of climate change so for us it's actually crucial to learn back from countries in the global south on what kind of building cultures they have where you don't need artificial cooling um, but through architecture and city design on how you can keep your spaces cool because i mean we all see what happens in paris in rome in berlin uh, in these extreme summer months where people are dying because the cities are getting too hot and that will get worse and worse. So I think we need a different kind of conversation and we have to move away from this very product driven approach, what we especially see internationally and come back to this. It's about the design approach. It's about rethinking, learning, understanding. Um, and this is where we are a big advocate for and where we're always very happy to share as well what doesn't work which I think is, is one of the key things. We have to move away from always the great announcement and all the marketing slogans. And uh, one guy said a year, two years ago at the climate conference, well, if all the companies are saving the world, who are the ones destroying it then? I don't know. I think that quote has been requoted again and again. But I think that's true. And I think we, we really have to come back to design. And it's, it's not only for buildings, but as well for many other products. The key is good design. And it's a holistic design. And this is, is where we have to move away from this industry driven, just selling things across the world. I mean, you, you just mentioned the new city in, in Saudi Arabia. I mean, there was one before, it's called Master City. Yeah. I don't know who ever, you know, went back and checked what, what came out of it. 
it, it was it didn't fulfill all the great ideas you know it set out to do i mean it was part that was built and that kind of works but they're cleaning the photovoltaic elements with drinking water because the PV elements are not designed for the dust in the city. And if you've been to Cairo or any city, they have a dust problem. So we need products that are developed for that context and not just saying, hey, we have a product, let's sell it everywhere. And uh, so this is it's a, maybe I a big totally fight. agree. But this is, I think, what we have to get out there as a message. Well, I mean, there's so many built environments like that, that, you know, you're talking about Master City, there's Bed Said, you mentioned Auroville, there's um, uh, Skipple Park 2020 is an example as well, but there's Hung Bayou, I think is how you say it, uh, William McDonough's big city in China that was kind of a total failure. Um, it was made for farmers, but the farmers didn't want to commute to their farms every day and, and, and that and it just didn't work because it wasn't built for the culture, the society wasn't built for the environment, it wasn't built how those people used that and, and we, we need to think globally, but we also need to act locally, we need yeah. to realize the culture and, and everywhere, even in Hamburg, Germany, there's this indigenous uh, culture, soil, uh, products, the way people work and function here on a harbor and things that are unique to that built environment. And we need specific, not only products, but also innovations and tools that kind of really make that, that work properly. And um, I, I'm in full alignment with you because I, I don't want to, I don't want to come back and hear how those, because they're all great projects, don't get me wrong, they're all great projects. They all have good intentions and a good vision of where they want to go. Um, they fail because we're not using that systemic approach, that systems view. We're not using the local environment. We're not realizing the culture. We're not taking all assets uh, or all facets of a complex system into consideration. Um, and this is why I personally love the, the built environment so much because there's that uh, schematics, the planning, there's the architectural, the design, which is before you even hammer one nail, before you lay any cement, before you site survey the, the field, the green field or do anything, you get to address what's the future? What's the future of this going to be and how you can design it properly and, and manage that before you even begin. And um, uh, there were some that didn't take those things into consideration. They didn't say, let's systemically look at what problems I'm solving in this local region and the culture and the people and the indigenous uh, organisms in, in that area before we start so that when we do it, it's gonna be a success instead of, oh, that didn't work. And I mean, there's there. I mean, there's so many I could go on on these great built environments that are there. You know, Fintorn and, and and that, and some work and some just don't. And some of them never get out of this smaller community. I mean, the other one, Songdo, Korea. I was there uh, February 2019. It, it, it's soulless. It's a ghost town. They built the whole thing. It's supposed to be the innovation city of the future. And uh, the firmware is outdated and it's all bitter, built around cars. They have these big roads and highways and, you know, and that's not thought out for the future. That's not thought out for where we need to go. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think it's one is a systematic approach and, and I'm, a big, I'm a big advocate for that because that needs you, means you do a data and fact-based, you know, and you really think about you know, which wheel do I need to turn where or, or which, you know, stakeholder do I have to activate in order to, to maybe move the, let the whole system move. But I think another thing, you know, and I'm, don't get me wrong, I'm a, I'm a full advocate for more experiments and, and for, you know, trying things, but we don't, what we need to introduce is this um, culture to discuss later what we've learned and if we made mistakes. You know, I, I think there are so many projects and they all try to do something good. Um, and then some achieved more than others. And, and what I would really like to see, maybe that's something we can do. Um, you know, actually in the end, you should do a conference. You should do a conference and could, would say, you know, let's talk about what are the lessons learned? What have we learned? What, what didn't work? You know, where did we have to improvise? 
because I, I always have that experience when I listen to someone talk, you know, and you have this super marketing, blah, blah, it's nice, but you, you don't really remember. And the things I remember are, you know, when someone is really sharing experience in a way where well, we tried this and it didn't really work. And then we did this or, and, and I think this kind of, of different and honest conversation, if we would introduce that on a wide scale, we would be able to move so much quicker and, and we would really share the right knowledge and not just always like, you know, the, the high render, the nice renderings and uh, like this group of architects in India, you know, they said, we don't hear these things. You know, we don't, we just see the great example. We just get a lot of brochures about products and we think, you know, this is how you, you're happy. You know, this is how you build. And we're like, no, <laughs> you know? So, and, and I think this kind of conversation, I would like to, to really introduce and emphasize much more globally. And uh, so I hope once the pandemic is going down, we, we can start doing workshops again. And because I think this is so, so important and so meaningful as well to, to people. The, the great thing about the built environment is that uh, if we do it right, if we do it how, how uh, you and your builders and the vision is, then it's also one that is in some, res uh, some respects very pandemic and very future proof because it automatically gives everyone enough space. It gives the social distancing. It gives the, the breathability, the environment, the safe long-term living. It's, it's more than a passive house. It's more than a passive uh, commercial uh, uh, building. It, it's just better for the future and, and less of these problems that we're really been dealing with now and that are, are probably still coming for us here in the future with, with other pandemics or other issues around cl climate change. Um, it's, it's just a better long-term way to give a little bit of resilience, a little bit of regeneration into how we live and work. And um, there, you know, you, you know that I'm a sustainable development goal advocate. I'm big on a sustainability environment. And uh, um, a, lot of, a lot of Germans would say, you know, Erke Merke or, or tree hugger, whatever they would say. But to be sustainable for me has really three strong pillars. And that is first and foremost, economics. So you have to not think about all our bad economic systems in the world but on ecological economics. And so in order to understand the bad economic systems, you also have to understand our, our world's ecological economics and how it works and what's the, what's the model that works the longest. And the second one is innovation, you know, uh, sustainable innovations, innovations that don't harm us to get us into that future, but are ones that solve some of our global grand challenges with systems thinking. And then the third one is a lot of people really don't understand or don't get is um, I'll say I'm a resilient futurist or a sustainable futurist. And they're like, what does the future have to do with sustainability? Is Mark a spaceman now? Is he a, a rocket man? No, um, the sustainability has everything to do with the future. It has to do with are we going to be around in the future? Are we going to have enough resources? Are we going to be able to live? Are we going to be able to... Um, pay our employers? Are we going to be able to continue building buildings and have infrastructure? Or are we going to be locked down? Are we going to have such climate catastrophes that that's not available in the future? And so I, I'm constantly thinking about the future using those foresight systems dynamic tools that will get us to, to a sustainable and even beyond a resilient future. And so th those are some pillars. But with all my sustainability and everything that uh, you kind of know that with the SDGs that we talk about, we, we kind of, I discussed with one of your employees, uh, Pia, about uh, the SDG integration and in, in one of your framework reports that you guys uh, put out, which was fabulous that all 17 of the United Nations sustainable development goals are tied to the built environment, to the future, that we're going there. And I would say almost 11 of them are tied intrinsically um, to the built environment as well. And that we need to quit se separating 
and this is how we get kind of a little bit more into li livability, separating our work life from our home life and that those are actually never been separate ever. They're all all together, but somehow we've we've kind of fought against those in that the sustainable development goals and where we're going in the future, they're for all of us. They're not for countries, they're not for cities, they're not for uh, governments, they're for us as individuals they're to provide us with a better life, to provide us with uh, uh, something for our families and children and on and on. I, I, we haven't touched at all on the simple fact that the built environment is the biggest impact on resources, carbon emissions, greenhouse gas emissions, that it takes up a lot of our resources, impacts a lot of our resources, breaks the water cycle in some respects uh, in, in some areas. And, and um, it's something that if it's not well thought out or progressive with our exponentially growing world, can really um, lead to some big disasters in the future. And so I don't wanna talk about the doom and gloom or and even touch upon it, but this is such a complex thing. I don't even think we're gonna have time to bring it up here today because I, I believe I only have about five more questions for you and then we have to, to call it good. But I just want our listeners to know we could talk about the future of concrete, the future of building materials. Are, are they sustainable? Or are they a big impact on our, on our environment? Do we have enough sand? Do we have enough? Uh, are we able to take the emissions hit on those business as usual uh, building products? Uh, what are the new ways that we build? Uh, now with the pandemic, we're you know, how are we getting the breathability of, of our buildings? You know, are, are, are they a breeder for pandemics? Are they a breeder for mold and viruses and, our, and, and things? And so there's so many things that we could talk about and maybe we're gonna need to schedule that for a, a different conversation. But I just want, want uh, our listeners, my listeners to know that, that this is a huge topic that, that it develops every moment of their life and the better built and, uh, environment you live in the one that's more sustainable and long term the better you will be the better your life will be the better your work will be the better your family will be it's just a better system and we need to be thinking about it and that leads me to my hardest question for you today it's the burning question wtf it's not the swear word, although we probably said it many times this past 12 months. It's what's the future? And you can answer that for you personally, or you can answer that for your organization. Well, I think, or I hope the future will be that sustainability will be the new normal, that all the, the issues you just described and, and touched on is that that becomes part of every decision we make either personally or business-wise um, when it comes to our built environment, that it's not an add-on, that it's not a marketing thing, that sustainability is a new normal, that it's maybe not sexy and not exciting anymore because everyone is doing it. And I think this has to be the future in order to, to have this systematic approach, that transformation, that that scale we, we desperately need. And and I think as well, the other part of the future is I think is empowerment, is empowerment of the people living or working in the building that they start asking the right questions. You know, it's not the challenge that everyone becomes a building expert, but I think everyone has to be empowered to play their part that, you know, tenants or people working in an office, they should start working, asking the right questions. And I think on the other side, empowerment is, and I think that's the good, good message. We are able today already to build carbon positive or climate positive buildings. We've awarded some of them, even one in Singapore. These are buildings that over a term a time frame of 12 months produce more energy than they consume. This is how we have to build the latest by 2050. And I think this is the good news and that's the future that we know what to do. We, we have the knowledge, we have the technologies, we know what doesn't work. And now the challenge is to scale it up. But to me, that is, is the future and that takes a lot of the 
complexity you just as well described out of the equation because certain things are not going to be exciting anymore because everyone will do a life cycle analysis and architects will just ask you know we want to have a carbon neutral concrete i don't care how you do it and so it's about empowerment and it's about really making it the new normal um, to that everyone is just doing it and i think this is, is what we have to keep on working on that's beautiful if there um, was one message that you could depart to my listeners as a sustainable takeaway that has the power to change their life, what would it be your message? Start doing it. Stop overthinking. Stop trying to, you know, with every decision, try not to solve all the problems at once. And uh, like I just said, the solutions are already out there. We know what to do. And we just have to do it step by step. So this is what I really would like to ask everyone. Stop the concerns because many things we've done in the past, the problems we have to deal with today, no one was overthinking them in a way how we overthink now the good things you try to implement into our society. So stop worrying, stop being super concerned and trust the experts. I think this is another big part. I think we should learn as well from the Corona pandemic. I know we are all now hobby uh, um, medical um, staff. Everyone is now an expert on vaccination and viruses, but there are actually people who are trained to do that. And we have that in the built environment. We have that in other industries. Um, so look behind the curtain, don't trust the marketing issues, but there are always experts out there, there are always expert communities such as us. So I think trust more and just try, you know, just get started and stop overthinking things. What should young innovators in your field be thinking about if they're looking for ways to make a real impact? Whether it's architects, builders, designers, engineers. Well, I think they should um, try to learn from the right from the right teachers, and they should really focus maybe on understanding one part really well, but have an overview and especially have an understanding for all the different stakeholders. Because I think this is in the build environment, you have so many different people kind of clashing in one project. You know, you have the finance driven in investor, a bank, a client who's normally not trained as an architect or engineer. You have architects, engineers and construction companies. And then if everyone thinks they're the most important one and they don't really accept that maybe the other one has some valid points. Um, I think this is, is where part, a lot of the, the not so good solutions in the end come out because then it's more about the ego and who's right than about doing the right thing. So to me, it would be really have an understanding, listen to people. I think this is another big part that people don't really listen anymore um, and really focus maybe on one thing where you see here, I can really make an impact. And then don't wait if your boss asks you to do it or your client, but really think about I can just do this extra mile a little bit and I will have a positive impact in the project and I don't always have to wait for someone. And I think last point, never lose the motivation because I know it is, can be very hard and depends on the, the environment you're working in. So find a way on how you can at least recharge and, and re-motivate. So every Monday morning, I always say, Monday mornings I come to the office and I want to save the world. Uh, Friday afternoon, I have to look into um, contract details and liability things. So, and then you have to over the weekend be able to recharge and start again from the high level because otherwise, I think you get lost in the operational daily problem based discussions. I like that. This really needs to be that separation and, and good planning there. What have you experienced or learned in your professional journey so far that you would have loved to know from the start, from the beginning? Well, maybe to um, maybe more understanding for the different stakeholders, what I just described, um, and more to, to really focus on the holistic part. And uh, to me, it was really when I was studying civil engineering, I had a great professor and uh, he was always talking about a bridge he designed in India, like a big bridge. Um, and 
he kind of pushed the client or the city or the municipality there in India to not weld, it was a steel construction, not to weld, but to use boats, like an old, you know, it's not modern tradition anymore, because he said it makes a difference. Bolting, you know, the local people there can do, and the, the women sell them food, and it's basically a whole infrastructure over two to three years of the construction. If you do welding, you have like the companies from China coming in, welding the bridge and moving again. And and he was able to, to make them do that. And that to me was so impressive that basically with every building, it doesn't matter if it's a house, if it's a bridge, it's whatever we do, we can have this positive social impact as well. And I think to that was to me was really like a, a key moment, let's say. But I, I think, you know, to, to have that more over time and, and over the years, I think now if I would start again, um, I would really emphasize on that right much more right from the beginning. That's all I have for you today, Christine. I mean, I would have loved to get more into the livability aspect of it, but uh, I, I think we could talk for days because I was just fascinated about the built environment and actually, honestly, really excited about where we're going and where we can go and how beautiful our future can be if we set the bar higher like you guys have done and i really appreciate you letting us inside your ideas on, on on this episode and if there's anything that you missed or didn't get a save now's your chance to 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 let us know what what we should absolutely know or if you missed anything you wanted to tell us well i can just repeat <laughs> i think my my big point stop overthinking i'm really Ah, and and really, you know, make a positive impact with whatever you do and try every day to make that and not give up and not over theorize, you know, theorize these things either. It's a lot of things are just, it's if you do the right things and we all, I think, have a certain understanding of what is right and when it comes to buildings, I mean, that we should not generate toxic waste, you know, that we should have a, a built environment where we feel happy and healthy. These are just the right things to do. And we don't need to have studies for that. And we don't need to have experts for that. So I think follow your gut feeling and uh, in terms of what's right and not what is always right for in the economic short term sense. Thank you so much, and I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks.